Hello and welcome to this live and interactive web stream. I'm Georgina Burnett. This week is Mental Health Awareness Week and this year it's centred around the issue of anxiety. So joining me today to discuss all manner of topics around this problem as well as more broader mental health issues is Dave Woodward from Insight Healthcare and Zoe Fennell who herself has suffered from anxiety as well as other mental health issues since the age of six. So welcome to you both. Hi. Now, we're live today, so if you have any questions for Dave or Zoe, please use the box on your screen and we'll do our best to tackle them over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. And if you uh, do want to uh, get involved and by tweeting, you can uh, use the hashtag BenAnxiety and we'll try and give you a mention. Now, first of all, Dave, a recent survey by Benenden Health highlights 38% of us think that one in four people in the UK suffers from mental health issue at one point point or other in their life. So what do we mean when we say mental health issues? Mental health issues is really uh, a kind of general expression which covers a broad range of problems that people can experience. Ranging from the fairly mild, just having feelings of panic or low mood, right through to quite complicated problems such as bipolar disorder where they have extreme fluctuations in mood or perhaps things where they may be hearing voices or seeing things that may, may or may not be there. So it's a broad brush term that covers anything from on a scale of 0 to 10, from quite low level problems up to very severe things, and include eating disorders, OCD, paranoia. So it's just a broad term really. Right, okay. Well Zoe, we'll hear about some of the struggles you've had with many of those issues. Um, but first of all, do you feel we do enough? I mean, what has the response been from um, healthcare experts and, and the public as well? Um, well, I get a lot of help from my friends and my family. Um, I have a good CPN. I find that medication for anxiety can be given out too easily. Right. And um, things like CBT have been really helpful for me rather than just taking medication. So lots of different ways of, of yeah. tackling it. Yeah, OK. Now, this year, Mental Health Awareness Week is concentrating on anxiety. So mm -hmm. what is anxiety, Dave, and, and what are the symptoms? I think anxiety is a natural response to a fearful situation where your body produces adrenaline as part of your fight-flight response. A lot of your people watching might have heard of that. When people get scared, we get the urge to either run or fight. And when that happens, our body gets pumped full of adrenaline, which can make your heart race, make your palms sweat, affect your sleep. So it gives people just a sense of jumpiness, unease, short-term memory problems. And some people get anxiety just in certain situations, say from a spider being in front of them, and perhaps their reaction is disproportionate to the fear that the spider should produce in somebody. Other people get anxiety in social situations, and some people have problems with what we call generalised anxiety, which is they just tend to worry a lot and then worry about their worry and feel anxious all the time. So you mentioned short-term memory loss. Mm -hmm. What are the short-term and long-term effects on people suffering from anxiety? Short term, over a few weeks or a few minutes or for hours, unless you have a medical problem with your heart or something like that, for, for your average person, very few side effects. And most of us do get anxious and don't worry too much about it when it happens and it passes. I think the problem comes if you're getting it very frequently, you're getting intense emotions with it or fear, and that it's lasting for longer than is comfortable. So if you're having con persistent periods of anxiety for months or weeks, then that can become a problem. So the short-term effects are very few. The long-term effects, it can make you irritable, it can make you jumpy, affect your sleep, and then if you don't sleep, then you get tired, and the whole thing kind of it makes a life of its own, and then you're more jumpy and you get into this vicious cycle of anxiety, they call it. Now, Zoe, you've, you've battled anxiety along with some other issues. How did it come into your life and, and what effect would you say it's had on you? Um, gosh, I would say, well, it started when I was six. Um, I don't know how it started. I think it's um, in my family. Um, it's affected my relationships with people mainly. Um, Obviously, panic attacks. I was getting up to 20 panic attacks a day. I wasn't able to leave the house. Um, it turned into agoraphobia. Um, and that's where CBT became helpful. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's cognitive <laughs> behavioural therapy. Yeah. yeah. And, and what, how did it present itself at, at the age of six then? Um, I wouldn't go into school unless my parents would sort of like drag me in and then I'd lock myself in the toilets. Um, I'd get sort of like these racing thoughts in my head, um, just sort of worrying about all these like different things that were going to happen, like whether a teacher was going to yell at me and like really simple things like that. Um, obviously the physical symptoms were like, you know, heart palpitations and sweating and um, stuff like that, yeah. Such a lot for such a young person yeah. to deal with. Um, how typical would you say that uh, Zoe's story is? I mean, how, how can we spot this um, and perhaps in others as well? Yeah. I think it's typical insofar as for some people, they might start with one symptom, which is just like a feeling of panic. And then they may begin to experience that feeling of panic, say in school, and associate the panic with the school place rather than just that they're panicking. Then they'll start avoiding school and then they'll start avoiding other places. So generally, they begin to avoid things that they think they are fearful of. And you said you ended up with agoraphobia, didn't you? Which means yeah. you can't go out. So for some people, the more they panic in different situations, the more their world shrinks until they don't want to go out. And that's a small number that end up with the problem of not being able to go out. But it's typical in terms of the the avoidance that people do to avoid feeling fearful helps keep the problem going. I think it's not so typical to start, I suppose, at six years old, and it's often missed because people just think, oh, it's just children, you know, not wanting to go yeah. to school or exaggerating, yeah. don't worry, they'll get over it. So they just keep trying to push people through it. So it's difficult, to, it's harder to spot in children than it is in adults yeah. because adults can express a bit more understanding and they have a bit more insight into what's going on and know when it's a problem. Um, I think what was helpful for Zoe was she said that her family and friends are very supportive yes. around and that is what we call a very good protective factor, means that bodes well for the future. If you've got supportive friends, families and you can maintain your social networks that you're more likely to do well with treatment. For some people that are lonely, isolated, elderly, um, we're pack animals at heart and we like that support and for people that are isolated for quite a long time it's harder to get them to reintegrate into the community and reconnect with people. Yeah. So it's asking for help isn't it? It is yeah. asking for help and of course children don't know they need help. Yeah. They don't yeah. know that their experience is different from anybody else's. Yeah. So for parents it is to be aware of things that might be going on longer than you'd thought. So if you had continual problems going into school then maybe seek some help and advice about yeah. it. Not necessarily a full-blown psychiatric assessment, but talk to your doctor and yeah. think, is there any strategies that you can do to help? Now, it just goes to show how many people are affected by this. We've had loads of questions in, so let, let's go mm -hmm. to one of the uh, uh, viewer questions. So this is from Jill. She says, um, your anxiety gets so bad, or her, anxi her anxiety gets so bad, um, that she feels it in the chest and mm -hmm. she has it's a hard job breathing. Yeah. Is there any way of coping with this? She says that she actually feels like she's having a heart attack. Yeah, that's very common and that's one of, I suppose, one of the definitions of a panic attack is that people think they're either losing control or having a heart attack. Uh, firstly, if, if you do get pains in chest, you should always get a medical checkup and make sure that there is nothing physically wrong with you. Uh, before you engage in any treatment so it is important to get that done. If after you've had the checks it's best to take the medical profession's word for it because they're pretty good at that. Some people just think oh they've missed something but they haven't normally. They're pretty good at checking your heart and things. So it's to, to remind yourself that you're not having a heart attack. Try and focus out because all the time you're focusing on your heart and thinking you're having a heart attack of course you're producing more adrenaline which is going to make your heart go faster and then you get more adrenaline and when we get adrenaline in our body we come what we call is threat focused so you only look for the negative so it is try and stay calm and I think perhaps read some stuff on the net about panic attacks and that explains that your body can only produce high levels of adrenaline for about 20-25 minutes so panic attacks you might have quite a lot in a day but they tend to only lark, go in cycles where they peak right. up and they naturally drop off if you're having lots and lots of panic attacks, I suppose you'd have to ask the question, if I was having this many heart attacks, would I still be here? Mm, so mm. probably just panic. Try not to think of yourself as weak or anything because they're so common. Uh, 
it's not a sign of weakness, it's just that your body is like a smoke alarm going off without any fire. Maybe yeah. you've burnt the toast, you may be a bit anxious, but it's not a big thing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Try and stay calm, uh, don't drink water, you don't need to breathe into carrier bags, you don't need to sit down, you might feel dizzy. So try and do the opposite, just try and carry on doing whatever you're doing and focus out. Read labels on tins if you're in a supermarket or something like that. So distraction is a good, good thing at the time when, when something like that's happening? It can be. You often yeah. find that people say they're, they're in the middle of a panic attack and the phone rings, they answer it and the panic attack goes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So once they begin to not focus on their physical yeah. symptoms, they begin to diminish. Right. Um, we've got a message from Jacqueline who says, um, what is considered to be the most effective medication and or therapy for anxiety? It's probably both of you could probably answer that. So what, what's... From your experience, what has been probably the best therapy that you've had, would you say? Um, cognitive behavioural therapy has, that obviously helped my agoraphobia um, because I just had to put myself in that situation which was just going out obviously and just getting through it. Um, yeah, I think learning different types of behaviours um, really helps. And how have you found medication as well? Um, I've been put on a lot of medication in the past. I've been put on diazepam, propanolol, lorazepam. I still take diazepam and propanolol, but I'm not... They do help, but they're also very highly addictive. So I would obviously suggest therapy over medication any day. So, I mean, this is obviously something that, that a, a doctor would need to, to tackle, but mm. what are your thoughts on, on medication and therapy? Uh, I'm probably biased because I am a cognitive behavioural therapist, so my leanings are towards cognitive behavioural therapy for anxiety. There's a lot of really good self-help material out there that people can find on the net. There's a website called Living Life to the Full where you can put yourself through a sort of your own process of cognitive behavioural therapy online and it's free. So uh, therapy first, try that. If that doesn't work, then sometimes a mixture of antidepressants and therapy can work well together. Uh, sometimes then some people find that when they get on the antidepressants they have trouble getting off them mm. afterwards. So it's best to go, go to your GP and work through a programme of reduction. And sometimes it's best to have, if you're already on antidepressants and you haven't had the therapy, is to go to your doctor, you don't want to be an antidepressants, go to your doctor and say, I don't want to be an antidepressants, can I have some therapy to run alongside whilst I come off the antidepressants right. and then the, the therapy teaches you ways of coping with the unpleasant emotions and feelings or tolerating the unpleasant emotions and feelings that come up when you stop taking the antidepressants so that's quite a good way of doing it. Now I, I know you can both answer this but probably Dave you're the best person to answer this. We've had quite a few people saying what is CBT so can you just uh, give us a, a summary of what it is? I can. Cognitive behavioural therapy is based on the notion that all of us act on beliefs and emotions which may not be true. So an example is 400 years ago, people uh, would not put to sea because they thought the world was flat and they'd fall off the edge. They weren't gonna fall off the edge, but they believed it so strongly it affected their behavior. A lot of us have beliefs that really strongly affect our behavior, like the belief that we're having a heart attack that somebody said there earlier. So you begin to strongly believe you're having a heart attack, which triggers the emotions, which then triggers behaviours, which might be avoidance of something or constantly re seeking reassurance from somebody. The difficulty is that most of these behaviours that people do then re reaffirm the negative beliefs and put people in a spiral. And they call it a vicious cycle. And CBT helps people move from what we call a vicious cycle to a virtuous cycle teaching them new ways of thinking, new coping strategies, new behaviours, or getting them to work out them out for their own. It's not so much teaching them. People can work out their own strategies. So it's supporting them to work out different coping strategies. Great stuff. Well, we've got one from Julie who says, anxiety worsens whenever I try to lower my antidepressants, mm. but I really want to stop taking them after 18 years. What would be the, um, what would be the advice for that? Yeah, the advice would be, as we said a minute ago, which is talk to your GP, try and get on a reduction dose and try and have your therapy alongside the tapering down of your medication and that can work quite well to, to help people come off medication and so you're doing it very slowly 
doing it slowly and to anticipate that you will feel worse for a while, a bit like having the flu. You're going to be ill, you're not going to like it, but it will end. Right. Try and visualise the end of the process. And they are just feelings, it's not a sign that something's wrong, they're just emotions. It will take time, not yes. to hurry, as you time. were saying. Yeah. 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 And plan it. Now, the research shows that women are twice as likely um, as men to experience anxiety. So why do you think it affects women more than men? I think, although the research kind of hints at that, I think the jury's still out on that. I think that men are less likely to present for treatment or admit that they have problems with it. There's a stigma attached to anxiety, that it's a sign of weakness, a sign of not coping, that somehow you're not a true man, you shouldn't cry. So there's a lot of cultural things about men that they don't want to express their emotions or talk about their emotions. So it is true that more women present for treatment, uh, particularly at the kind of what we call primary care or to their GP. But in hospitals, it tends to be men that commit suicide or that men's that end up as inpatients without ever having to been to see a therapist before. Right. So men are more likely to delay asking for help, I think is, is probably as much the issue as the fact that women suffer it from more than men. I just don't think men will talk about it. Right. Um, Zoe, how, what have you found has helped um, you to control your anxiety? I mean, you talked about friends and family. What, what did they do as well that, that helps? Um, well, I think knowing that a few of them suffer with anxiety themselves helped me to realise that I wasn't the only one like struggling and going through it. Um, sorry, I forgot the question. No, I was just wondering, and, and you yourself as well, what, what have you found has really helped you to, to control, whether it's moments of anxiety or, or longer periods? Um, it's mainly been um, videos on YouTube, um, like pro things like progressive muscle relaxation, um, breathing exercises. Um, I used to try to sort of distract myself through panic attacks, but because they got so bad, um, it actually helped me to just sit there with my headphones in and just do these exercises, and then I'd walk away and I'd feel a lot better. Right, and we're so lucky to have that these days, yeah. aren't we? So. You can take it, like you can put it on your iPod or you know, your tablet, take it anywhere, yeah. so it's good. Yeah, that's a really helpful tip. Um, we've got James actually saying, I think about death a lot and I've read that this could be a symptom of anxiety, is that right? I saw my dad die when I was a teenager and it plagues me. It can be a sign of anxiety, <clears throat> but it can be a sign of, um, I suppose, childhood trauma mm. as well and if this person's getting images or nightmares or recurrent things about death it's probably best that they do try and talk to a therapist about it because there may be images and things that get stuck when people have traumatic experiences and things happen in life they tend to get stuck in the wrong bit of the brain there's a bit of the brain called the working memory uh, which is for things like oh here's my glass of water that's where I put that and there's the bit called the long-term memory which is for things like oh where did I go on holiday in 1999 and you, you have to actively try to remember it with the working memory people often get intrusive thoughts or images of bad things that happened in the past but when they have them they feel like they're happening now right. instead of being a long time ago so they've got a sense they're not date stamped mm -hmm. sense of nowness about it so it could be general anxiety the person suffering about and a lot of us worry about death you know in one form or another it's how much it's affecting his life mm -hmm. and does he need to seek help with that is, is probably the main question which is difficult to tell how much it's impacting on his life yeah. is if, if he's not able to function not able to go to work not able to make friends or relationships from it then that's a big impact on his life and he might need some specialist help to sort that out that's sort of might as well see see your GP about see it. See your GP, get some cognitive <laughs> behavioural therapy. Yeah. The therapies over the past four or five years have become much more widely available in the NHS. Uh, both the previous government, the Labour government and the Conservative government have continued to pour money into a programme called Improving Access to Psychological Therapies and they've trained about 7,000 cognitive behavioural therapists nationally. So there's a lot more available now, so go and see your GP, you should be able to get treatment free fairly quickly. Oh, great. Across the country. 
Um, a message from uh, a, another Julie. What's the best way to deal with intrusive thoughts? So we've, we have we have covered that just then. That she says that she struggles with thoughts of harming her children, and it breaks her heart and causes her extreme anxiety. Mm -hmm. She's told um, she has general anxiety disorder by her her GP and psychologist. So it's obviously a common thing. I don't I don't know the case entirely, but often having thoughts about harming others uh, where you know you're never going to harm them, if that is the case, if she says, I've never harmed them, I don't want to harm them, my worst nightmare is harming my children. It's more often linked to a form of OCD that we call pure O, mm. which is where you get intrusive and obsessive thoughts which come into your mind and you begin to believe them as if they were true and you can't get rid of them and they get stuck. And they're so horrid that people try and push them out of their mind. And that's like pushing an ice cube down in the glass. It won't, it won't go away. You just keep trying to get rid of it. Uh, and there's a really good book called Stop Obsessing by Edna Foer, which is probably worth getting and reading. Uh, or read up on the internet about puro and obsessive thoughts and get some help with it. It can be... I've, I've treated several people with that recently. And within five or six sessions, you can quite change your life, providing you can cope with the distress that the therapy causes because it does you do have to be able to tolerate the unpleasant thoughts to get rid of them it's a bit counterintuitive you almost have to think about them more mm. for the anxiety levels to go down right. and often people need support in doing that with a therapist to begin to do that process because it's too frightening for them to do on their own mm. so the first step is admitting it's a problem which is done second step is try and do your research yourself on the internet and if that doesn't work go and see gp and get some help i don't from what the lady said, it doesn't sound like general anxiety, it sounds like a form of OCD to right. me. Right, okay. Um, we mentioned before about um, being able to get CBT on the NHS, so does that mean that if somebody is suffering mm -hmm. from anxiety, they can go to their GP and they'll be referred um, on the NHS for CBT? Uh, across definitely England, I don't know which part of the world we're looking at, I don't know about Scotland and Wales, but definitely across England, uh, the system is much improved to what it was four years ago and it should be available on the NHS. And they should get what we call a NICE guidance treatment, which is National Institute of Clinical Excellence recommended treatment. And most waiting lists across the country are now down to about five or six weeks. It was one time it was years. This is for adults. For mm -hmm. children, the situation varies from county to county. But things are much improved. So just talk to your GP, look it up online, go to the NHS Choices website that's got information and you should be able to provide local providers. Sometimes you don't even have to go to your GP. Sometimes there'll just be a telephone number you can ring up. I know in Kent that's the case where I ring. You don't have to go to your GP. You can just look up a list of providers, ring one up and say, can I have an appointment? Yeah. So it, can, it could be that straightforward. So, sorry, first of all, I'll ask both of you this, but just, just finally, what should somebody do if they think that they or, or somebody or a loved one or friend is suffering from anxiety? What, what would your advice be to them? Um, I would try and talk to them and let them know that there is support available um, or that I'm just there as a friend, but I would um, obviously suggest going to see a GP and Sometimes it isn't as easy as just going to see a GP and the GP is like, oh yeah, here's a the therapy. I think sometimes you have to fight for it, but it's definitely worth fighting for. So reassure them they're not yeah. alone, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Dave? What would your advice be? I think that reassure them they're not alone. Get, try to get alongside them, but try not to come across as critical because they may already be worried. The crit often people with anxiety are harsh self-critics anyway. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to breach with some people without them getting cross or going, no, that's not me. Things. So just try and, it may not even go to the GP. There is lots of material out there in books, libraries. There's a thing called the Books Can Help scheme in a lot of, can, so recommend that perhaps they do some reading or just try and get alongside and be supportive. And I'll ask, probably not, best not to tell them they look anxious, is ask them how they're feeling mm, to yeah. get them to name it yeah. so that they're doing the sort of, opening up yeah yeah oh that's wonderful well i'm afraid we've run out of time now but thank you very much guys and thank you to everybody who has sent in questions as well we've had lots of questions and hopefully we've managed to answer them in one way or another um my thanks to dave woodward and to zoe Fennell for joining us today and if you want to find out more about coping with anxiety go to www.benenden.co.uk thanks for watching and goodbye